Good morning, everybody. We're just stilling, letting people come in and then we'll get started. So probably in another minute. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started in about uh, 30 seconds. Okay, I think everybody's found a chair and I'm sure there'll be others joining us in the next, uh, next few minutes. So we'll get started this morning. And uh, first of all, uh, for those that haven't met in this uh, world we live in, um, my name is Chris Kilford. I'm the president of the Canadian International Council, uh, Victoria Branch here on Vancouver Island. I'd like to welcome you to our event today. I'd like to uh, thank our panelists for being here this morning. And I think we've got um, the makings of a, of a really great event today. So before we do get started, I think it's important as always to recognize that CIC Victoria members uh, live, work and learn on unceded Coast Salish territory. And we give thanks to the Lekwungen people, now known, as, now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations for allowing us to meet on their traditional lands. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Canadian International Council, we are an independent member-driven think tank we have branches across the country in 18 cities. Our national office is in Toronto, and all of us are interested in foreign affairs and Canada's place in the world. And certainly, I think most of us were watching the election last night, uh, like you were as well. Um, if you can find out more about us by Googling the Canadian International Council, and if you're not a member and you are interested in joining us uh, at, at CIC Victoria, I, I'll put my email address in the chat later on. And by all means, drop me a line and I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, connect with you and talk about what we do. And we do have a Facebook page, um, uh, CIC Victoria on Facebook. So please have a look there. So what we're gonna do this morning is first of all, I'm gonna set the scene and uh, then introduce our, our three panelists who will each speak about their experiences in Afghanistan and their thoughts on the future of the country. We've left ample time for discussion and Q&A, so we are going to 11.15 today for those of you who can stay that extra 15 minutes. And if you do have questions for our uh, panelists, please use that Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll find at the, at the bottom of, of your screen. So let's get started. And I think the first thing I could say is, well, how time flies. And it was only back in April uh, 2021 that US President Joe Biden announced that by 11 September 2021, 20 years after the 9-11 uh, took place, that the United States would withdraw all of its troops from Afghanistan. Of course, we now know that events in Washington and Kabul unfolded much faster than the international community ever expected. As we've all heard many times, I suspect, the US-Afghan war was the longest war that America has ever thought, fought. It lasted through two George Bush, uh, W. Bush administrations, the two Barack Obama administrations and the Donald Trump administration. The war in Afghanistan was also Canada's longest war from 2001 to 2014. And it was our first significant combat engagement since the Korean War. More than 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members served in Afghanistan. In total, 165 Canadians were killed, 158 of them soldiers and seven civilians, and more than 2,000 soldiers were wounded or injured. It took just a week from August 9th to the 16th for the Taliban to conquer the first major city in Afghanistan and then the last. Almost immediately, the finger pointing began, especially in the United States. CNN blamed the Afghan military. The diplomat placed the blame on President Ashraf Ghani and other government officials in Afghanistan for their corruption, which destroyed their national legitimacy. Former Trump Defense Secretary Mark Esper blamed his old boss for continuing to 
want to withdraw American forces out, out of Afghanistan. Unsurprisingly, Trump blamed Biden, calling on him to resign in disgrace for his handling of the situation. Likewise, Fox News blamed the Biden administration for choosing to ignore intelligence of an imminent Taliban takeover. In Canada, the finger pointing began as well. And with the Canadian embassy in Kabul closed, many Afghans who had served alongside our military or in other supporting roles were left to fend for themselves. In numerous cases, individuals and private groups came to the rescue. And to their credit, our diplomats and military were able to return to Kabul in very difficult circumstances to save as many as they could. Officially, Canada announced the resettlement of up to 20,000 vulnerable Afghan nationals to Canada. And looking at a number of newspaper articles yesterday, Afghan refugees are arriving in their hundreds across the country. To explore all of this and more, I'm pleased to have with me today our three panelists who have had a great deal of experience serving or working in Afghanistan. And I also spent one year myself at the embassy in Kabul from 2009 to 2010 as the deputy military attache. Our panelists, and in the order they will be speaking uh, this morning, include Colonel Retired Jamie Hammond. Jamie commanded Canada's Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan in 2002, and later founded the Canadian Special Operations Regiment before returning to Afghanistan for another year in 2010-2011 as the Chief of Transition and Campaign Assessment Group in NATO's International Security Ass Assistance Force headquarters in Kabul. During his career, he's served all over the world in places such as Bosnia, Brunei, Germany, the UK, and Hong Kong. And after retiring from the military, he served as the private secretary to the Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia and as, assistant deputy minister, as an assistant deputy minister in the BC government. He currently teaches international trade to graduate students at Royal Roads and is completing a PhD in political science at the University of Victoria. Dr. Athena Madan has experience working in the humanitarian field in more than 20 countries and five continents, including Afghanistan. She has worked with Doctors Without Borders, the Carter Center, the UN High Commission for Refugees, the World Health Organization, and many grassroots non-governmental organizations. In particular, Athena worked in Afghanistan as a health worker, including midwifery training, maternal and child health intervention and rehabilitating child soldiers with local non-governmental organizations from 2012 onward. And finally, Corey Levine is a human rights specialist and peace building policy and program expert, researcher and writer with a special specialization in gender. She has spent more than 20 years working in conflict areas, including Afghanistan, Bosnia, East Timor, Iraq, Kosovo, Mali, Palestine, Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, and Ukraine. And Corey also recently returned this summer from Kabul after spending eight months with uh, UN women and has recently been published in a range of newspapers about the unfolding events in Afghanistan. So welcome to all of our panelists. And uh, Jamie, I'll hand the floor over to you for your comments. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, uh, this is a great panel with, with very different practical experiences, which is uh, always fun. Uh, and just looking at the participant list, I'm intimidated by the people in the audience. So I'm sure we'll have some great questions. Um, I would like to talk about two wars, three questions, and then just finish my short period about uh, talking about Canada. And, and the two wars are because I deployed in uh, 2002, in uh, September 11th, 2001, I was a graduate student at Carleton University, uh, just starting on a three-year uh, subsidized uh, doctoral program. Uh, I'd already done my comps. All I had to do was write a thesis, and then September 11th happened. And I was soon, because I had a background in counterterrorism, I was soon called back in. I uh, found myself running the Afghanistan desk in our special operations office in National Defense Headquarters, and then deployed uh, to Afghanistan in 2002. So that was the first war. And it was a very different war than the one we all watched on TV later on. But that was a war where I was uh, in charge of a group that were tracking down Al Qaeda and Taliban leaders. Many of those uh, Taliban leaders, I found out later, tried to surrender. Uh, but there was, there was no 
uh, no thought of that, certainly from the Bush administration at the time or from Rumsfeld. Um, and so I would have people off in valleys in Afghanistan, uh, special operations teams with uh, signals intercept capability, listening to conversations in the valleys, some valley in central Afghanistan uh, where people would be uh, talking about the Taliban. Uh, they would be friends of the Taliban. We knew they, the Taliban were visiting them. Uh, and yet they were all very respectful of Karzai and the new government and they couldn't wait for the new government to get its feet under it. And so that started showing me the complexity of Afghanistan. Um, nevertheless, that was a war that pretty much was finished uh, by the summer of 2002, the fall of 2002. Um, and you could already feel in Kandahar at that time that the American attention was elsewhere. And it wasn't just the fact that the Americans were talking about going into Iraq, we were actually losing assets. So we couldn't do our jobs uh, in Afghanistan because they were already taking things away and, and getting ready for a di very different war where at its peak, they had about 180,000 troops in Iraq and they never had more than 20,000 troops in Afghanistan until the big uh, surges under the Obama administration around starting in uh, 2009. Nevertheless, that's the first war. It was a very different war. It was, from a military perspective, an easy war. It, it was go in, fight, find somebody, uh, detain them, that type of thing. Uh, however, the second war, and that was uh, one that uh, most Canadians participated in um, and uh, went on until 2011 for combat operations, was a very different war. It was a nation building um, and a counterinsurgency campaign. And it was very different. By the time the Canadians got to Kandahar in 2006 or so, I would argue that we had already set the seeds for uh, a problem. We had allied ourselves with warlords who were the problem that created the Taliban in the first place in the 1990s. Uh, people like, uh, like Shirzai, uh, Gul, uh, Gulaga uh, Shirzai, uh, who was governor of Kandahar uh, just until the period when the Canadians went back to Kandahar. Um, and so we had created a problem there. We didn't allow for any form of reconciliation with Taliban leaders. And in spite of the fact that people like Karzai, who had been a strong supporter of the Taliban in the 1990s and might have been their ambassador to the United Nations, we still had, could give no quarter to the Taliban. And that created a problem that the Canadians found when they arrived. And in spite of fantastic work and, and courage by development workers, by diplomats and military, we've found ourselves in a position where there's just not enough force and not enough uh, military troops or not enough military troops, diplomats or, um, or uh, development workers to go around. And so you could go into a village, you could do a fantastic job for a few weeks, but when you left, everyone knew the Taliban were gonna come back because they were part of the families. Um, and so that, that's the second war, a much harder war. Um, and, um, you know, and one that now we would go back and look at it and argue, you know, did we win? Well, you know, the three questions I wanna talk about, one is the speed of the Taliban uh, takeover. Um, and there's many different conspiracy theories about that uh, in Afghanistan and on Afghan Twitter. Um, but the truth is the, the Afghan people chose the Taliban over violence. They didn't choose them because of political things. They just had, were fed up with war. No one in Afghanistan talks about a 20 year war like we do. They talk about a 40 year war, 42 year war from about 1978 onward or 1979, I suppose, onward, um, they've been in conflict. And that was the conflict they were trying to solve. Um, for us, we were just there for a small part of it. So the speed of the Taliban takeover, uh, a surprise to everyone, including the Taliban, and they have said that. Um, and yet it was really, and the Afghan Analyst Network have done a great job of uh, um, basically interviewing people in different provinces like Lagman province, where the attitude in that province even though there were people that wanted uh, an uprising force to be created and people who were Tajik and not uh, Pashtun, in spite of that, they said, look, the government didn't do anything for me. Why should I risk my life and my family's life to fight these guys? Let's just let it happen. And that's what happened in province after province and city after city. Um, 
There still is a question of what happened to the Afghan National Security Forces. Um, there's video clips of the Taliban inside the palace, inside Dostum's very palatial uh, residence in Kabul. Um, and yet the Afghan National Security Forces who prior to the middle of August had three concentric rings of security around the palace did nothing. And you do have to ask whether this was really a war or a form of coup, a complex form of coup. Ashraf Ghani fled the palace, left the country, and yet Karzai, who lived on the palace grounds, didn't. And very soon afterwards, Karzai Hekmatyar, who was a, a Mujahideen um, allied with and against the Taliban off and on throughout uh, the 90s and, and after, um, and uh, Abdullah Abdullah, who was originally from the Northern Alliance and was the chief executive officer under the last election uh, results, um, they were sitting down and negotiating with the Taliban very quickly. And so it wasn't a war that was lost. It, something else was going on and something more complicated is happening. Um, the second question for me, you know, as, so the Taliban took over very quickly. The second question is, is you know what about all those people that served with Canada? And that was an issue, I think a temporary issue in the Canadian news. Um, it's a, a sad, sad stories. There's all sorts of um, families who wanted to depart. Um, some work was done and there's much criticism of, of the Canadian government's efforts and a lack of foresight. And yet we do have to remember that our war ended in 2011. That's when Canada stopped fighting. So anybody who shared the risks with Canada on the front line in the military interpreter, which is what the news media tends to look at, um, that's, that was about a decade ago. The real people we should be worried about are the human rights workers, the women, the, uh, the educators, and the elites. And, and I think about a place like Haiti who um, lost the elites. That's the people that left. And so the country, Haiti was a, was a very well uh, educated country at one time, and yet all the educated people left under uh, the various thugs and um, in the history of Haiti. And that's my fear for Afghanistan is that, that those educated elites all leave and you're left with the Taliban. Um, the third question I've got is just, was the sacrifice worth it? Well, what I say to veterans, and I've said a number of times on news and, and interviews, is, is it was worth it. Afghanistan in 2014 was very different than Afghanistan in 20, 2001. Uh, the Taliban are now in 2021 inheriting a country that's very different from the one they left in 2001. The question is, can will the Taliban live up to some of their statements that they're making at higher political levels or will it go back down to the lowest common denominator of Afghan society and and that's the uneducated sort of mujahideen. And that's the risk for women. There's all sorts of examples of women standing up for their rights. There's also examples where women's rights are not being respected. And so the jury's still out on what happens with the Taliban. But the last thing I'd say is just for Canada, you know, what did we, what could we have done differently? And, and the first thing I would say is we should have understood Afghanistan better than we did. We didn't. Uh, Ken Calder, the Assistant Deputy Minister uh, for Policy and National Defense Headquarters said at the time, we don't know a thing about this country. When I was there as a task force commander in 2002, one CSIS rep visited during my time there, but there was nobody on the ground. There were no diplomats that knew what was going on. And there were very few non-governmental workers that came and went, very few. And so Canada as a country, we didn't understand the country at all. Um, perhaps if we had have understood the country better, and perhaps if we made an effort to put diplomats in difficult positions, not just in our priority trade countries, but in those places, put more funding into uh, foreign affairs or Global Affairs Canada, put more funding into international journalists so we actually can have a Canadian spin on some of these places, uh, we would understand better what was going on. And we probably might have thought some of this through a little bit differently. The final thing is take an, you know, keep an eye on corruption. Don't expect or accept that a certain level of corruption is okay. That has to be a focus for all of us, not just, not just a few 
um, financially focused development workers, but it's got to be for the military as well. And uh, I think that's those are the kinds of things that I start taking away from it. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. I just have a quick uh, hot pursuit for you. Um, you were there uh, in various capacities. Uh, your, your soldiers, your officers, your non-commissioned officers, have you heard from them? How are they sort of um, experiencing what's happened? Um, because they obviously saw their colleagues killed in action and so on. And I, and I know the Afghan people, they are our primary focus. Uh, but, but from your soldiers' perspectives, have you heard from them? Yeah, from some, there, there's a mix of emotions. Um, I try to send the message that I, I talked about of, you know, actually it was worth it. If you look at the stats on Afghanistan 2014 from 2001, uh, there's no question that Afghanistan, um, there were many, many positive changes in Afghanistan. You know, will they stay? That's the question. From a soldier's perspective, there's lots of frustration out there. Um, I haven't talked to anybody who's kind of said, oh, well, now that changes everything. It just wasn't worth it. There was always those frustrations. Um, but even families of the fallen that I've talked to, um, there's, a, there's a strong feeling of, of specific experience of their loved one who believed in what they were doing. And so that, that doesn't change. Um, I do know from a lot of veterans, there were huge frustrations over the, uh, the issue of bringing interpreters out of the country or protecting people who worked alongside Canada on human rights. Um, so there's frustrations and even anger in that. And some of that uh, was also because here we were in an election campaign, whether we should have been or not, that's another question. But during an election campaign, there was a little bit of, of anger that perhaps was uh, political anger that you know, was raised through the Afghanistan sort of discussions and things as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'll turn over to uh, Athena. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Chris. And it's nice to be invited. Uh, nice to see everyone. And again, I am also honored to be alongside this esteemed group of panelists and also looking through the attendee list. I'm excited to be here and speak to you right now and then learn with and alongside you in the Q&A period. So I have a couple of uh, slides just to give you some visuals of some of the stories that I wanted to share with you today. Um, I was in Afghanistan, I've been off and on since 2012 in various capacities. Can everyone see my screen? Great. Um, oh, I guess the screen is thinking. So these are just some various snippets of my work in Afghanistan. And uh, this is a picture from, for those who have been there, this is Jerusalem Palace. And uh, for those who are familiar with the palace, it is a very significant uh, space in Kabul and it represents to Kabuli people or to Afghan people their country and their wars that it still stands despite significant adversities. So it's been bombed and set on fire multiple times in the struggles to overtake the country since Jamie mentioned since since generations of war not just the 20 year war. And so because I was aligned with local NGOs here's a slide of initiatives that have helped support Chris mentioned that in the intro. And I've worked with local NGOs mostly, three of them, which I will not name for reasons of security and safety, as, as we're aware. Um, and also looking at, I trained, at, I trained midwifery and social determinants of health uh, physicians in, at Kabul University, and as an independent evaluator with ministries in Afghanistan and uh, allied actors of which the United States Air Force and uh, some residual um, some residual, there were Canadians, the crisis group that I linked up with in the UN and the UNHCR, the Afghan National Army and the uh, Afghan Analyst Network that Jamie also mentioned. So I had a, a, I was quite diffuse in who I interfaced with and my particular role was helping support local NGOs for various initiatives. And I think that in, in one part, because I was affiliated with NGOs, the narratives that I think that I have to share today or more aligned with community perspectives. And I think my segue that I'd like to pick up on is the thread that Jamie said about what could we have done better? I was preparing some thoughts about what were our gains and where are those gains now and where do we expect those gains to be in the future? And so part of that underpinning is what did we know about Afghanistan? What could we have known better? And then where are, like, where, where is the progress that we did make with the community members on the ground? Where are the relationships that we made? Where are those now? And, and how does that 
play out in what we could expect or what we could anticipate for Afghanistan. So I just have one slide of a number of different pictures of people that I interfaced with over my time. Um, I also worked quite heavily in the northeast and northwest parts of the country with the Hazaras who are currently um, experiencing, they've continually experienced genocide from from governments of Afghanistan, and it's worse now under the under the rule of the Taliban. Um, so I hesitate to speak to one particular story experience more, but I think the crux of my narrative that I'd like to share, the perspectives of people on the ground were such that they did feel misunderstood by generations of people who had, or generations of countries who had occupied their lands and uh, specific to foreign actors, not fully understanding and respecting the culture and traditions that they had held and the complexity of those traditions. And I think that that tension, which we saw very much uh, play out, that led to the rise of the Taliban or the, the rising again of the Taliban in the uh, fall after, after um, 2001 and 2002, just the complexity with which tribal conflicts were able to um, take precedent in, in courts in civil uh, law, in areas where people tried to resolve conflicts, the ideas that uh, of governance as had been tried to influence through the United States and Canada were largely rejected by people that I interfaced with, not because of any hatred or anger necessarily, but because of the desire to self-determine that people felt weren't respected on their ground. So I'll just go ahead and tell uh, just some brief snippets or vignettes that you see in these pictures here because part of my work as I reflect on my work is also just the relationships that I had built with people in the NGOs and on the ground. So on the top left you see here this was Shamshad who was nine years old who was very much an ambassador for my teams in Kandahar whenever we would visit his village. Um, unfortunately he is one of the 80 percent of casualties of children that were sustained in the Afghan war and so it is safe for me to show his picture here. Um, but he is someone whose loss I reflect on almost every day as I think about my work in, in Afghanistan. And the tensions that feel are felt geopolitically are very much uh, children. I, I worry about the children in the next generation because they have only seen generations of war. Um, a lot of them feel enmity, exclusion, and desires for revenge. Uh, very, 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 very palpably, which has led into social navigation to, for child soldiering, for taking up arms. And so I, I'm curious about, Jamie talked about the elites, the, the flight from Afghanistan. <clears throat> for many of those children who depended on the foreign uh, forces to befriend them, to show them alternate ways of learning, of having fun, of connecting with uh, different races and cultures and traditions, all of that is a, is a force that is lost. So I do, one of my concerns is the gain that we made in friendshiping or community peace building, I worry that that is not going to uh, take root and many children will only know feeling abandoned or feeling anger or just continuing the cycle of when you go to school, those who are permitted to go to school, stepping over people's bodies in the middle of the street in order to achieve their in order to, to go to their to their um, to their their school. Middle picture. I worked in a midwifery clinic. Uh, top at the midwifery clinic. Um, something too that because of the gains that we made and uh, the gains that were made for girls to attend school, uh, there is a lot of, of feed on Twitter and on social media about girls not girls dreaming to become doctors who will no longer be able to become doctors. So what does this mean for the gains that we had in maternal and child health outcomes? We did have gains in that child mortality was able to decrease over the period of since I was there in 2012, but certainly even since there were interventions in maternal and child health uh, initiatives in 2007, since I was aware of with the Ministry of Health. Those gains are likely to be set back, especially as we see health clinics being destroyed and infrastructure not being made available for access to uh, to women and children in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Um, I played a lot of football, which is what you see in the right column of the of the slides here. I played a lot with with children in in um, some orphanages and in just some peace building camps where mixed races and playing between genders was allowed or mixed races being tribal races. Um, and I also looked bottom picture, bottom middle pictures, looking at uh, addictions. So we also did a lot of work on literacy with social 
and political forces of addictions that were linked to the drug trade, that were linked to uh, weaving of blankets and the uh, rug trade where people became addicted on opiates to, to mitigate the pain from sitting for 12 hours uh, or not having proper nutrition over those 12 hours. So I did a lot of diffuse work in, in a number of different ways. But the stories that I was able to understand, I think, um, help sustain some of the pain that, that I think was expressed at the community level. And it certainly wasn't all stories of pain, losses, and enmity. It was certainly stories of friendship. It was certainly stories of trying to reconcile and trying to be understood um, and, and share their, their richness of cultural traditions to someone like myself, who was very much a foreigner in their, in their midst. Having said that, because I also wasn't white, I did have access to a number of communities and I often was taken as someone who is Pashtun or in some areas Hazara myself. So I did find that uh, some people, my, uh, on a personal level, my involvement at the community level to be able to help facilitate or support the initiatives for these gains, my presence was also, as I'm sure many of our panelists have felt, there were also power differentials that we needed to also play through in order to understand um, how to best help those communities leverage the resources that they wanted to, to support, best support themselves. Um, I'll just close with one last picture on the bottom right. Why I have that there is because I was also asked by the Afghan football team to take pictures of their games. And that was actually considered quite an honor for me to be able to do that for the football teams. Uh, because I was considered at that time um, the level of trust of our particular group of people and initiatives that we were, that we were uh, helping support. I think at the end of my time, the last time I was there was in 2018, um, certainly the levels of trust varied with each time that I came back, but the candor in which people were able to share and tell their stories to understand, so that we could understand um, the complexity of their traditions and why people acted as they did in order to support uh, political revenge on one hand or enmity and anger towards foreign troops on the other hand. Those feelings and circumstances helped me understand the vulnerability uh, that, that was self-protective. So on a closing note, what I do now in my particular work and where I'm concerned about the future of Afghanistan, I still keep in touch with many of my colleagues. Um, many of those, as Jamie also mentioned, have left the country and uh, are concerned about their colleagues and, and sometimes family members who are still left behind. And in many instances, the women themselves who are very politically active, who have held positions of leadership in education, are feeling the need to burn their credentials, um, to, hide their, to hide their accomplishments. Because right now, even though the Taliban has stated that they are trying to rebrand as a moderate force, we can see that that is certainly not the case with the initiatives that have been instituted. Um, I think Time also mentioned Mullah uh, in Time magazine. Uh, the current Mullah is one of the 100, um, 100, uh, 100 um, most oh, influential is the word, most influential leaders of the world when girls under 12 are now unable to go to school and 50% of the cabinets are known terrorists. And so that Western support uh, for desperately needed financial aid is desired or stated to be desired, and yet there is no desire to collaborate with Western forces. So I'm concerned about the humanitarian situation of people in <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> I apologize, my two-year-old is in the background, very excited to see different people's faces on the computer. Um, so I think now, because there's very little foreign influence, my gains that I may have made with community uh, the NGOs that I was able to uh, feel part of and support, I likely will not be able to go back to Afghanistan anytime soon because of the situation there. Um, and many, lo many external actors likely won't unless they have some mandated political power that will come at great, uh, likely very great and cautious uh, preparation in order to do so. So I think uh, it's down to the humanitarian actors in Afghanistan and um, the women are also making gains in protests and political activity, but I'm concerned about the state of healthcare, of education, and of the ability to, to deliver humanitarian aid in the future, in the immediate, in the immediate future of Afghanistan. 
So I think um, yeah, I've taken up more than my five minutes, but I'll pass, pass the baton back to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. I'm also a big uh, soccer fan, a player. And I remember in 2010 in Kabul, going to watch um, an inter-school competition, soccer, uh, girls' schools. Uh, it was a big deal, I mean, to have this. And uh, we take these things for granted. Um, but there it was, it, was, it was the first time and everybody was so, so excited that this was taking place. I do have some questions for you, but I'm going to wait because I'm probably going to tie into some questions that I have for, for both of you regarding uh, women in Afghanistan. So I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Corey, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Chris. A delight to be here this morning. And as everyone has pointed out, um, esteemed uh, fellow panelists, um, Jamie and Athena, and uh, yes, that's quite an array of uh, the participant list. So um, yeah, just happy to be here um, to be able to share my experiences. And I look forward to um, a discussion. So I'll just begin by saying that um, you asked for a, you know, a more personal touch, which is not something that I often do in, in my speaking engagements, but it gives me an opportunity to look back at um, 20 years of working in and out of Afghanistan. Um, so I'll begin by saying I first went to Afghanistan in um, March of 2002. I was there for three months at the behest of uh, the Canadian International Development Agency, um, trying to figure out ways to look at um, spending at what seemed at that time a huge amount of money, um, $250 million that Canada had earmarked for peace building activities. Um, and then, as you mentioned, I last, um, I actually just came back from Afghanistan at the end of June. I was there um, for eight months working with a UN woman um, uh, to support Afghan women parliamentarians. So, um, those are the two end posts of a 20 year engagement in Afghanistan, which has been about five years on the ground altogether. And I think, um, I guess I bring both of Jamie's worlds and Athena's worlds together in a way because um, I have spent a lot of time on the ground. I spent three months, as I said, traveling all over Afghanistan at, in the beginning when it was very safe to do so. Um, I wore a burqa simply because in those days, um, the biggest security risk was risk of carjacking. And um, so to hide the fact that I was a foreigner and therefore less likely to get carjacked, um, I sat quietly in back with a burqa on as we as I drove from Kabul to Mazar in the north, to Jalalabad in the southeast, to Kandahar in the south. Um, so I had an extraordinary opportunity to, to, to meet people, many of whom were returning after years um, away. And I everywhere I went, I was greeted um, and invited into people's homes, perfect strangers would come up and you know, invite me to stay for dinner for a week. Um, you know, there, there was an incredible amount of openness, warmth and hospitality. And then fast forward, you know, 19 and a half years, I end up being locked up in a UN compound with little engagement with Afghans, um, ordinary Afghans, except for my co Afghan colleagues um, who are the privileged um, and the elite members of Afghan society because they're educated, they speak English, um, they're working for an international organization. So um, it is a trajectory of moving from engaging with ordinary Afghans on an everyday basis to having 
almost no contact with them. But with as a UN worker, that is not our primary goal. I was I've also worked for the the UN mission there. We worked um, our interlocutors, our main interlocutors were the government. Um, the, again, ministries, ministers, um, you know, people in um, high up positions. Um, and I also engaged with um, the military, of course, over the years, the um, uh, military forces, particularly when um, international forces had um, provincial reconstruction teams on the ground in the early years. So this just sort of gives you an idea of the broad range of my experience in the country. And what I'd like to do is just sort of pick up on some of the points that both uh, Jamie and Athena raised in, in, in terms of sort of locating what those experiences actually were. Um, so I think Jamie did a fairly good job of identifying, you know, some of the critical areas of what happened in Afghanistan. And I'll just give you an example of what, um, as an illustration of, of um, how we engaged a lot with the wrong people, as it were, and how we promoted um, many of the warlords um, who Jamie spoke about, who had power and continued to have power um, uh, and um, facilitated by us. So um, in, um, I think it was around May of 2002, I had the opportunity to meet um, sort of a mid-level warlord was the first warlord I'd ever met in my life. Um, we went to meet him at his compound at a province in southern Afghanistan. He handed me his business card. I'd never had a business card from a warlord before. He had two of them. His official title was commander of the southern zone campaign. And um, he was very open and frank. And when I asked him where did he get his funding and his support, he said, the Americans. And I said, okay, which Americans? Military, uh, State Department, USAID. He said he didn't know. They just arrived once a month with a trunk full of cash and just gave him the cash. He took me to his landing strip where he was later accused of using to smuggle antiquities out of Afghanistan. And then a few years after that, he was appointed governor of that province by um, the former president Karzai. So this is the kind of, um, you know, Afghanistan, we did not understand Afghanistan. We do not understand Afghanistan still. We went in with no willingness really to try and understand how Afghanistan works, which is it is a village in a way. People are connected to each other. There's tribal connections. There's, you know, um, family, powerful family connections. And we just um, blindly blundered through a dynamic that is impossible for any foreigner to, to understand and facilitated, um, you know, in our so-called nation building, we facilitated a dynamic that was directly oppositional to the nation building. Um, so I wanted, I, I found it interesting because we all have our own perspectives, but for, for Jamie, his first war ended, he said around 2002, 2003. For me, it didn't end until around 2005, 2006, when I noticed a change in tone from, you know, the nation building and, and emphasis on rights, women's rights in particular, 
to an emphasis on security. And that's where we turn the corner and move from really committing to Afghanistan and committing to, you know, the need to um, our own security as internationals in, uh, on the ground in Afghanistan and the security of our forces. And that took up a lot of our funding um, that we funneled to the country. So very little of it um, trickled down through, you know, as Jamie's talked about, you know, corruption, but also, um, you know, expensive, high paid um, people like me to be, <laughs> get our, uh, salaries to get our ourselves housed and to ensure that we were secure. Um, so there were so many layers that didn't allow the funding, the billions and billions and billions of dollars of funding to actually trickle down and really make a difference um, in these communities. Um, I, I just want to point out that uh, Jamie's comment about how Afghan people chose the Taliban over violence. And I'd like to say actually with respect, I think that's true for some Afghan men and particularly maybe um, Pashtun men, but it is definitely not true for women and girls. I cannot tell you, I have spent 20 years talking to Afghan women and girls, and I can tell you, I have rarely met any woman who is supportive of the Taliban. And I, again, I respectfully disagree with you about how the jury is still out on the Taliban. Um, as one women's rights activist put it to me, um, you know, unless they start appointing women in positions, I cannot believe or trust anything that the Taliban says. And we have, just in the last week, we have the examples of um, girls no longer being able to continue their education beyond primary school. Um, the closure on Friday of the Ministry of Women's Affairs and turning into a ministry for the old Taliban. I, I, it has a new name. They like to create a new name, but basically for the Ministry for the Prevention of Vice and the Promotion of Virtue. And on Sunday, a decree was sent out by the new um, Taliban appointed mayor of Kabul, uh, stating that um, municipal female municipal workers were no longer needed. So personally, I do not think the jury is out on the Taliban. I don't think um, there has ever been, as people keep asking or calling it a Taliban, Taliban 2.0. Um, and I don't think um, we'll see any change. In fact, I think um, the situation will continue to um, get worse as soon as the world's attention is no longer squarely on Afghanistan and that we will see them completely going back to um, what we saw in the 1990s, albeit with a more tech savvy Taliban who understand the power of social media and who understand the power of needing to communicate um, a certain language because they do need the international community's assistance. And as Athena talked about, there is an, a humanitarian crisis on the ground. Um, COVID has been devastating to the country um, that has not been talked about or is really in the news. Um, but certainly it was very clear when I was just there a few months ago um, of the impact of COVID, although it is hard to get um, a lot of information because the health infrastructure is so weak, um, it's hard to um, 
collect that data. So I'm concerned about, I will leave it here. One is, what is the international community going to do with the reality of the Taliban leadership? I have to say that I um, was impressed that uh, the Trudeau government took the stand that they did. I think that is personally the right stand by refusing to recognize um, the Taliban leadership. They were not democratically elected. Um, they came to power through force, even though there was you know, very little fighting. Um, and they are, um, they are not um, adhering to any of the laws of the land or international laws that Afghanistan has signed on to. Um, I don't know how long the rest of the international community will, um, they're sitting on the fence, it seems to me, the, the Europeans, Russia, China, et cetera, is world powers have already recognized the Taliban. So I, I think we really need to um, continue to advocate that the Taliban should not be recognized. However, we need to work with them to avert um, a, a humanitarian disaster that is unfolding. So that is a delicate balancing act. Um, that I think will be challenging to do, but we need to do it in order to ensure that the Afghan people, um, as has been pointed out, who've been suffering for over 40 years, don't continue to suffer any longer. Um, so uh, I'll just say one more thing. I'm in constant contact with um, people that I've known for 20 years and with the Afghan women parliamentarians who um, I worked so closely with for the last eight months, um, some of whom have managed to get out, many of whom are still in Afghanistan. Um, and um, yeah, the situation is quite dire. So um, I'll leave it there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. That was uh, wonderful because your your breadth of experience from 2002 until now having those different perspectives, I think is vital for us, your fellow panelists, and also the audience as well. And I, I do have um, a question for uh, Athena and, and Corey. And for Jamie uh, in the Q&A, David uh, has asked a question of, of you. And I'm wondering if you can have a look at that while I ask Athena and, and Corey uh, this particular question, because it does concern women in Afghanistan, and there has been a lot of soul searching. There's, as I said earlier on, a lot of finger pointing. Uh, could we have done this? Could we have done that? There's this discussion of the elites in the cities versus the uh, people in the rural communities. And um, I was reading an article yesterday by Cheryl Bernard, um, and, and it's, it was titled the, the Truth About Afghan Women. The media has focused on a few feminists in Kabul. And, and she wrote that you know, the largest segment of, of, of women in Afghanistan are the urban poor, the rural population, and the internally displaced. And their situation has barely changed over, over two centuries, never mind the past 20 years. So uh, it's one of the things that's, because when I was in Kabul, you know, even while we were there and providing security, women were walking around still in burqas, even in Kabul, covered head to toe. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering um, how much of a difference did we actually make outside of, of what they would call the Kabul, you know, the Kabul bubble and, and elsewhere. Did, did we get out into the communities? Where's their real change taking place? Athena, maybe I'll, uh, I'll start with you. Thanks. Uh, great question. And I did read that piece. And uh, I agree that the majority of women in Afghanistan are the urban poor and not even urban poor. Um, also just in, in rural mountainous or rural regions where they have fewer access to goods and services. Um, my my answer to your question is did we make any gains has life changed for those women it, it really depends on who you ask then uh, de depending on where they are for hazara women there were some gains made in literacy there were some gains made in maternal and child health outcomes but again with the taliban which i agree with corey uh, even though it's trying to be branded as the taliban 2.0 the leadership are still the fundamental the, the leadership are still those who comprise the taliban the first version 
and they are still more militant. And um, the, the lack of centralized governance of the Taliban at the moment, where people still interpret uh, Sharia law as being st strictly oppressive with respect to women's rights, is, is still largely intact. So um, some of the women that I speak to, just to supplement something that Corey also said, there are a lot of women who don't support the Taliban, and this is probably, this is true in my experience as well, and I've traveled to 30, uh, 34 of the province, all of the provinces in Afghanistan, and I have spoken with women and children with, as a health actor and as an evaluator, but at the same time, a lot of those conversations are held in confidence and in private, and these are not opinions that in some instances are able to be shared in their own living rooms and their own homes, given uh, the affiliations that maybe their husbands may have that are secretive. So a lot of the, one of the good things that I found as a health actor, if I may, uh, when I was working in hospitals, because the hospitals were segregated by genders, in the women's area for the hospitals, they became places where women were able to mobilize and where they were able to discuss their concerns, uh, their experiences, as well as how they wanted to change uh, dynamics, how they wanted to change laws, how they wanted to increase their own power to be able to uh, advocate for education and human uh, and uh, and governance more successfully. So, with when I also hear that health infrastructure is being targeted, I think of that dynamic, and I suspect that that was something that I saw and knew as an external actor. I would imagine that people also felt that. So with the destruction of health infrastructure, that was one place where women were able to safely mobilize away from the prying eyes of their neighbors or their uh, their husbands who were given resources or controlled by different facets of the Taliban, um, not because of their desire to affiliate, but because of just desires to survive. So. Um, I, I think I just totally went on a tangent, but that is the dynamic to answer that question. And I'll pass the baton to Corey. Um, uh, thanks, Chris, for your question. I agree, it's a great question. And thank you, Athena, um, for your comments. I completely agree with Athena. I, I think in my experiences in traveling to places like Kandahar, or um, Daikundi um, or Jalalabad, Mazar, um, places, uh, um, regions where there was sort of more international intervention. Some did get, um, there was some effort to really get out into the rural communities, but again, as Athena pointed, out. It, it depends on who you talk to. And there wasn't, I think, the, the, nowhere was there the kind of um, change for rural women, um, illiterate women, the way there was for the Kababal woman. And that Kababal um, existed in um, most of the provincial capitals in the region, so not only in Kabul, but where all women um, had access to um, international support from the west of the country and Herat to the south and Kandahar and, and so on. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, women wouldn't want the kinds of changes that were possibly open to them. And I met um, illiterate female entrepreneurs who, you know, were widows and were scraping by and with, you know, some funding were able to have lives that were transformed and it was incredible to see. And, you know, that will all be lost. I met women in prison who saw no changes to their lives because they were in prison mostly because for laws that weren't really on the books, but um, we didn't have an opportunity or there wasn't an opportunity as, um, you know, change takes time. It doesn't take 10 years or 20 years, but it takes, you know, generational change. So women were being imprisoned for violating social norms and, and not laws because 
those who were adjudicating on this still saw this as law. So, you know, going to the grocery store without a mayram, which is a, a male escort, which was still the norm in many places outside of the urban centers. Um, you know, their lives hadn't really changed, but the fact that they had access to internationals coming in to see, okay, how can we maybe address this, uh, these issues, at least write about it, bring awareness to it, possibly intervene in their cases. So the potential was there. And I think that's what made the difference. And uh, the last comment I'd like to say about um, burqas, everybody talks about <laughs> Afghanistan and, and the burqa, it's a very iconic um, image. But for women, the burqa isn't really the issue. The issue is the alarming rates of violence that they experience in the home, on the streets. Um, you know, whether they're covered or, 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 or not. Um, that's what women always told me. And, you know, Westerners um, would always, you know, make a thing, oh, well, you know, women are still wearing burqas or not wearing burqas. It's, you know, a part of the culture, you know, for, many hundreds of years in rural areas, in areas um, that didn't um, see as much um, change in the country. But we have this in Canada. We have, I, I come from um, New Brunswick and, you know, where it's, you know, a resource-based economy. It's worlds apart from Toronto where I lived for, you know, 10 years. So, you see that in, in all countries. And Afghanistan is just, I, I, I think, just more of an extreme aspect of that. Thank you, Corey. And I, I'd like to just turn over to a question from the audience, Dave, uh, David, here in, in Victoria and Jamie. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really important question because it does talk about um, the West's arrogance. I know we've touched on this uh, coming into countries and thinking that they can change the country in a very short period of time. And believe me, 20 years is a very short period of time. And um, you know, what we, do we leave behind at the end of the day when we do this? And, and um, you know, who, who benefits and who loses? And quite frankly, I've always said in the media myself, it's the Afghan people that have lost decade after decade after decade. Um, but I know you've had a chance to look at David's question. Um, how would you answer him? Well, it's, it's a great question. I think we've all talked to it. But um, if uh, in 2001 and 2002, there was no question uh, Canada was going to participate along with its allies and go into Afghanistan. And Canadian polling was very high and very strong in favor of doing something. It was in the 68-ish percent at that time. It wasn't till sort of the 2005 period, as Corey mentioned, that, that things changed and Canadian support for operations in Afghanistan also started to change uh, at that time. But, um, you know, are we naive? Yes, we are naive. As, as I tried to point out, we didn't know what we were getting into. As Corey's pointed out, we still don't understand Afghan society. I went and visited a police station looking at corruption in the, one of the uh, districts in South Kabul. Um, a woman, at, during this meeting, there's 13 of us in the room, a woman kicks the door open. She's fully covered in a burqa and she is screaming at the police chief uh, over issues within her family that she's brought to their attention and they did nothing. Later on, she was escorted out and it was all very condescending and, and things. And then later on though, she came back in with her sister. Her sister was not wearing a burqa, uh, or it could have been sister-in-law, I'm not certain now, but um, she sat down and uh, was not wearing a burqa. And actually she was a very forceful woman and, and clearly telling the police what needed to happen and things like that. Um, Eventually, though, I turned to my interpreter. I said, I wonder why is she wearing a burqa and she's not? Uh, and they're from the same family. This is nothing, obviously, to do with religion. And he later on asked the woman and she said, 
I don't want people to see me like this because she was so distraught. And for her, the burqa was a bit of protection. And, and so I really support Corey's comment that, that it might be a symptom, but it's not the problem. There's all sorts of other more complex things going on. Um, can we change that nation? Well, I, I do think the international community over 20 years helped Afghanistan recognize that, or Afghan women recognize that they have rights. There are some rights, whereas, and there was the ability, certainly the UN statistics on access to healthcare changed from something like 9% of the population had access to healthcare within an hour to about 60% over those uh, decades. So things did change. There are things we can do, but, but using the military to do human rights work isn't, isn't, you know, we're reaching for the tool we happen to have in the toolbox rather than creating the right tools. And part of creating the right tools is being engaged in the world uh, before crises happen so that we actually have some understanding of what's going on and then we can define how we can help. Um, and just sending the military in is, is not the right answer. I think Canada committed to the, to the ISAP expansion, um, you know, I, uh, based on what all our peers were doing and because we didn't want to go to Iraq. Uh, mm -hmm. quite frankly, that was one of the reasons. Um, in 2009, 2010, the surge started and I was there um, collating all the statistics in Afghanistan on security, government and development in 2011, 2010, 2011. Um, and we sitting in an ISAF headquarters actually rationalized the increase in violence in Helmand um, in all sorts of different ways. When the, the fact was we sent a whole bunch of Marines into Helmand and we started fights. And you could see the statistics going up and the violence going up. And we were becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And yet, once you, once you commit, you cross that Rubicon and you commit military forces, things are going to happen in different ways. And so we have to be very careful about how we you know, commit. I still argue that putting a lid on some of the violence for a period of time in order to allow development and governance and healthcare work, all that to, to carry on can be helpful, but it's not part of the solution. It's only a temporary fix to allow the real solution to be worked on. I do think there is a responsibility for the international community to get involved in, if you call it nation building, fine, but I would say it's, it's really, we do have to engage with the Taliban. We don't necessarily have to recognize them. I agree completely with Corey. Um, but at the same time, if we want to get things done in Afghanistan, there's gotta be some kind of work uh, with, with the Taliban. Um, and we do need to recognize the Taliban are factions they are Haqqani and the Keta Shura never agree on everything. There's all sorts of different factions. And right now we need to work with those moderate Taliban who can help. Uh, in, otherwise, they, they will do exactly as Corey is suggesting. And, and over time, as the international community stops watching, um, things will divert back to really a medieval approach to things. This ties into a question that Jane had and Corey referred to, uh, you know, Taliban 2.0. We've all seen the Taliban with the cell phones and media savvy today uh, versus how they acted in years past. And, uh, you know, Corey, I, 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 the destruction of antiquities that we saw before and, and libraries and so forth, in your view, is this just another, is it, is it a week? Do we have to wait a week for this to start happening? Or, or is, is there going to be a difference this time around? That's a great question, Chris. Um, it's it's hard to say at this point. Um, you know, the the Taliban are more savvy, and they understand that they, you know, the world will maybe get more on them when they do things like you know, blow up thousand year old. Buddhist statues than when they oppress women and girls, it seems. Um, so it, it's hard to say. I, I actually um, had the opportunity to tour the um, museum in the National Museum in Afghanistan in, in 2002 and the level of destruction that had 
been um, uh, done by the Taliban was just heartbreaking. Um, and how I got there was because I, um, there were in people selling antiquities in, in the north. I bought a bunch and brought them back to Kabul and, and gave them to the museum only to discover that many of them were fakes themselves and it was a way for people to earn money off of people like me. Um, uh, but that was okay. Um, I, I honestly, it, it, is, it is very hard to say what that's going to look like. Um, the Darulaman Palace at Athena Mansion has been completely rebuilt. It uh, dominates the skyline out near where the parliament um, that um, India built for the Afghans um, looks like what the Taliban will do with these kinds of um, buildings will be um, interesting to see because um, they represent um, something, you know, the former government um, and they, I think that they are not going to want to have remnants around or reminders around of the former government. So I think it's those buildings that in the beginning or symbols of the former government that um, will um, be more in, in the Taliban's crossbow. Thanks, Corey. I, I see that we're, we're coming up to 1115. So we have a few minutes left. And I just, uh, I, I think this has been one of the most interesting uh, panels that I've had to host since we started doing Zoom events and hearing from you all. Um, all of all four of us have real experience but we, of course, are in the safety of Canada and we're far away and we're watching events unfold and uh, really concerned about how, how things will, will go. And I know we couldn't get to everybody's individual questions, uh, Roy and Alvi and so forth. But I think uh, much of, of, of what you were asking vis-a-vis -vis corruption, uh, Corey definitely uh, <laughs> talked about corruption and, and, and of course, uh, undermining everything uh, that, that we were attempting to do in, in many ways. And, your own personal experiences are, are just uh, terrific. Um, we need to get together and do this again, and we are. And for those uh, who are in Victoria and are CIC Victoria members, Jamie and Corey and myself will be at the Sticky Wicket Pub in a few days time, and we'll be doing this live and, and speaking about the situation um, in, in Afghanistan. So I'd like to, to thank our panelists for participating today. Uh, and, and giving us uh, your heartfelt uh, comments on what's happening there. And I'd like to thank the audience as well for joining us from all over the country. Uh, it's, it's been terrific to have you here and thank you for your questions. We do have a lot of upcoming events uh, on our schedule here in Victoria. I did mention our politics in the pub on the 21st of September is coming up. And then uh, we have another one with Jonathan Manthorpe talking about uh, foreign policy issues. I'm also very happy to say that uh, Keith Mines who has just left the US State Department uh, in 2019. Uh, he was the Consul General in Mazari Sharif for the United States and served in Afghanistan in other capacities. Um, the, he will be with us also by Zoom and we will have three copies of his latest book on nation building, very apropos uh, for our CIC members. And we, we pick uh, uh, three CIC members randomly and, and they receive a copy of the book in question. And so we've got that coming up. And then just to move away from Afghanistan, we'll be having Nathan Vanderclip uh, here in town for an in-person event at the Union Club, uh, speaking about uh, China and his reflections on China. And he was the Globe and Mail's uh, Asia correspondent for a very, very long time. And somebody asked me when the PIP is, when Jamie and Corey and I will be getting together. It's on the 21st of September. And uh, CIC Victoria members would have received a notice uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions, the audience is going to be very small, smaller than normal. So if you're interested, you need to, uh, you need to uh, let, um, let us know. Um, I put my email in the chat area. I can send you the poster if you didn't receive it. But you do need to be a CIC Victoria member. And so talk to me about that if you're not a member. So I think, um, Chris, I, sorry, yeah. The, the, the 21st September is when we're having the politics in the pub, which yeah. is today. <laughs> What? You, oh, I, you said 21st I, September. 
thank you so much, Jamie. I I got that completely wrong. I'm getting so excited. I, I got it wrong. It's actually the, the PIP is on the 4th of October. So that'll give us at least a couple of weeks to figure out what's going on now in Afghanistan. And, and so that's Corey, Jamie, and I on the 4th of October. I'm, I'm sorry, I got the, I, I was looking at today's event. So yeah, so do to get in touch uh, about CIC and that event. And it's 11.15. So I'm gonna let the panelists go. Thank you, everybody. And uh, looking forward to, to contact to you um, or speaking with you at some point, either here or in person in the near future. Have a, have a great day, Jamie, Athena, Corey, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.